I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And I want to continue what is just a brief series entitled, A Supreme Look at the Sovereign Christ. We have been in the book of Hebrews for the last year and a half, and I felt it would be good for us to step out of that series for just a couple of weeks to catch our breath, to gain a sense of perspective before we step back into that series shortly, I have wanted us to focus upon the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, how spiritually healthy it is for every one of us to be preoccupied with the glory that belongs to Jesus Christ alone. And so we find ourselves in one of the most extraordinary passages in all the Bible. In fact, it could be argued this is the supreme passage that theologically defines the grandeur, the greatness, and the glory of Jesus Christ. We believe that these words were originally an early hymn that was sung in the first century church. As the church now begins to uh, expand and grow and need for singing and worship, this is like a doctrinal statement that is set to music. And the Apostle Paul takes this Colossian hymn and incorporates it into this first chapter for purpose. Because in the church at Colossae there was some wavering as to the identity of Christ, not by the true believers, but by false teachers who were coming in and distorting the reality of who Jesus is. And so Paul must now bring definition and bring clarity because to Christ because everything hinges upon Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. And when the chief cornerstone is rightly in place, then all of the stones find their proper alignment in relationship to the chief cornerstone. But when the chief cornerstone is moved out of place, the entire building is out of place. Every person in the church is out of place and disoriented and, and dysfunctional spiritually. But when Christ is rightly set as the chief cornerstone, now I can bring my life into alignment with Him. You can bring your life into alignment with Him. And we can be in right alignment with one another, but only when the chief cornerstone is first set in place. Everything in the church hinges upon the proper placement of the chief cornerstone. He is set down first, and all of us now find our proper place around Him. I say again, if He is out of place, we can never be in place and right before God. And so Paul writes these words, beginning in verse 15. We have already looked at verses 15 through the first part of verse 20. We will pick up our exposition and Verse 20 today, but I want to take even these extra seconds to read beginning in verse 15. He, referring unmistakably to the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, He is the image of the invisible God. There's His deity. The firstborn of all creation. There's His sovereignty. For by Him, and notice, Him alone, all things were created. There's His exclusivity. Both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. There's His eternality. And in Him all things hold together. There's His authority. He is also head of the body, the church. And He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that He Himself, I love the word Himself in the Bible, He and He alone will come to have first place in everything. For it was all the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness. And this refers to the fullness of deity. For all the fullness of deity to dwell in Him. And through Him, to reconcile all things to Himself. 
That is His victory. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, that encapsulates the entirety of the human race. There are no innocent heathen anywhere on the globe. The entire human race in rebellion against God. Verse 22, yet He has now reconciled you, believers, in His fleshly body through death, in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I want to ask you a question. How can we really know who Jesus Christ is? Now, this question has long been raised through the ages and has received no shortage of answers. Some people answer that Jesus is, is who their sentimentalities make Him to be. The Jesus of their childhood fantasies. The Jesus of their youthful imaginations. Other people answer that Jesus is who some shallow song makes Him out to be. The Jesus of the music industry. The Jesus of some superficial contemporary song. Still other people answer that Jesus is who the culture presents Him to be. The Jesus of some syrupy Christmas pageant. The Jesus of some Easter production. Still other people say that Jesus is who their bizarre dream or supposed vision represents Him to be. The Jesus of their existential... Uh, ecstatic experience, or the Jesus of their hyped up emotions. Yet others claim that Jesus is who they conjure Him up to be in their own minds. The Jesus of their own mental invention. The Jesus of their own vain imaginations. Others say He is the Jesus of who our church says He is. Despite all of this, the truth is there is only one Jesus. And He is the Jesus of the Bible. He is the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He is the Jesus of the prophets and the apostles. He is the Jesus who cleansed the temple and walked on water. He is the Jesus who cursed the fig tree and raised the dead. He is the Jesus of the virgin birth and the empty tomb. He is the Jesus who touched the lepers and condemned the Pharisees. He is the Jesus of sovereign grace and electing love. He is the Jesus of the final judgment and eternal life. He is the Jesus with the keys of death and Hades. He is the Jesus who is the creator of the universe, the controller of history, and the consummation of the ages. Not the Jesus of someone's shallow imaginations. Not the Jesus of someone's hyper-emotional dreams. Not the Jesus of some syrupy chorus. He is the Jesus revealed forever in inspired pages of Scripture. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is what makes these verses in Colossians chapter 1 so critically important because they answer the question, who really is Jesus? They make Jesus known to us, and more than that, they make the real Jesus known to us, not another Jesus. These are perhaps the most revealing verses in the entire Bible regarding who Jesus truly is. No one who wants to know Christ can afford to be ignorant of any of these phrases and any of these lines. To this point, we have seen that Jesus is seven things. Jesus is God, verse 15. Jesus is sovereign, verse 15. Jesus is creator, verse 16. Jesus is eternal, verse 17. Jesus is sustainer, verse 17. Jesus is Lord, verse 18. And Jesus is Savior, verses 19 to 23. There you have it. That's who the real Jesus is. Now, last time together, we began to develop verses 19 and 20 regarding Jesus is Savior. 
And verses 15 through 18 have really simply served to be the foundation upon which His Saviorhood is placed. In other words, in verses 15 through 18, He has been arguing the person of Christ. Now, beginning in verse 19, the work of Christ as our Savior. And He reminds us in verse 19, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Only someone who is fully God could redeem us from our sins. Only someone who has all the fullness of deity in Him when He hung upon that cross could accomplish an infinite work for sinners. No man, not even the best of men, if that's all that He is, but a mere man could ever accomplish an atonement for all who would believe down through the centuries. Only someone who is infinitely God could accomplish a death with infinite value. And so Paul repeats in verse 19, the deity of Christ. You remove the deity of Christ and you make His death like the death of any other mere mortal. You insert the deity of Christ rightly in its place and the death of Christ suddenly has unlimited effect upon all creation. And so we began looking at verse 20, this very troublesome phrase at the beginning of verse 20, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself. And we pondered, what does this mean to reconcile all things to Himself? Does this mean, does this teach universalism that all things will be brought, will be reconciled and a, a, a salvific way to Himself, and in the end, everyone is saved. We know that's not what this is saying, because the full counsel of God teaches that those who reject Christ will perish. Worse, those who never even hear of Christ, but die without Christ, never to even reject Him will perish as well. Because there is salvation in no other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Others say, well, this is uh, a universal atonement. Uh, This is a hypothetical potential atonement that Jesus died for all men and those who believe upon Him receive the merit of the atonement and the rest upon their rejection, will then go to hell. The only problem is that's not what this verse says. It doesn't say that He would potentially, possibly, reconcile all things to Himself. There is an actual accomplishment that took place 2,000 years ago upon the cross. It is finished. It is definitive. And what He did upon that cross was He actually reconciled No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He actually reconciled upon the cross all things to Himself regardless of how all things respond to Him. And so we we developed that last Lord's Day. And the meaning of this is that He has changed the status completely of all creation. And by His death upon the cross, and what the Father then has entrusted to Him by raising Him from the dead, and sitting Him at His right hand, and giving to Him all authority in heaven and earth, that all creation which He spoke into existence is now brought into a position of submission before Him. All creation is brought into a posture of subjugation before His throne. That's why in Philippians 2, verses 9-11, through Therefore, every knee will bow, whether things in heaven or on earth or under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will do so in this life in salvation. Others will do so in that final day in damnation. 
But every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the meaning of these opening ver- this opening phrase in verse 20, to reconcile all things to Himself. Some reconciled in salvation, others reconciled in condemnation, some reconciled to heaven, others reconciled to hell, but all reconciled in submission to His throne at the right hand of God the Father. Now, I want to develop this some more. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and all that I have to say will be still under this seventh heading, Jesus is Savior. And I want you to see how all things are brought into submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who by His death upon the cross has earned the right to be exalted to the Father's right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want your eye to be especially attentive to the two words, all things, because that's what we have been looking at in Colossians 1, all things created by Him, all things created for Him. He is before all things might have first place in everything. He has reconciled all things to Himself. I want to begin looking at verse 20. But as we consider all things, I want you to see in verse 27, all things mentioned three times. All things mentioned in verse 28 twice. Uh, Verse 24, all rule, all authority and power. Verse 25, all His enemies. This amplifies with even greater theological clarity what this means that He has reconciled all things to Himself. Now notice, in Colossians it doesn't say He reconciled, has reconciled all things to the Father. It's that He has brought everything into relationship to Himself who has been appointed by the Father as judge of the living and the dead. So beginning in verse 20, but now... Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. And whenever a believer dies, it's pictured metaphorically as being asleep in Christ. Jesus, by His resurrection, verse 20, is the firstfruits of those who are asleep. Firstfruits meaning the first installment of a future harvest. Uh, It means a prototype or pattern. As Jesus has been raised from the dead, so shall all others after Him be raised from the dead. That's the meaning. Now in verse 21, For since by a man came death, who would that be? Adam. By a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Who is that? That is the second Adam, Jesus Christ. So Adam brought death into this world, and Christ has brought eternal life into this world, and the eternal life that Jesus brings is greater than the death that Adam brings. Adam brought death. Jesus has brought life through His resurrection that is far greater than the death that Adam has brought. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, that word all refers to all mankind, the entirety of the human race has died in Adam. Romans 5, verse 12, when Adam sinned, all sinned. At that moment in time, his sin was charged to all of our account thousands of years before we were even created in our mother's womb. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. This all is a different all. All believers... All the sheep, all the elect, if you will. All those whom the Father has given to the Son, it is these who will be made alive. Who of us could argue that? Who of us would want to extend this all beyond all believers who are saved? It is only these who will be made alive with eternal life in Christ. 
verse 23, but each in its own order. Number one, Christ the first fruits. That's the first resurrection 2,000 years ago. And after that, those who are Christ at His coming. Now, there will be a resurrection at the end of this age, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. There will be a resurrection at the end of the Great Tribulation, Daniel 12, verse 2. And there will be a resurrection at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, Roman, uh, Revelation 20. So there is this sequential order. First Christ will be raised, then the church will be raised, then tribulation saints will be raised, and then millennial believers will be raised. Verse 24, then comes the end. And the end here refers to the eternal state. Revelation 21 and 22, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth and the holy Jerusalem comes down from above and hovers over the new created earth. Then comes the end. The end of the end. The beginning of the end. The eternal state. Now notice what happens then. When He, that refers to, to Christ, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when He has abolished that He is Jesus Christ, all rule and all authority and power. So, history is unfolding to this climactic consummation when Jesus will abolish all opposition to the kingdom of God. And Jesus will be the executor of that abolishment. Verse 25. For He that refers to Christ must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. And this looks down the corridors of time and He is reigning now at the right hand of God the Father, reigning in providence, reigning through His works upon the earth. He will reign during the Great Tribulation as King of kings, Lord of lords, come back to this earth and rule for a thousand literal years upon this planet. And then at the end of that time, Jesus will subjugate all unbelievers to Himself. He will cast Satan into hell forever and ever. And He will abolish even death and there will be no more death he will abolish everything that is in opposition to the throne of God. And so he says in verse 27, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. That is another way of saying what Paul wrote in Colossians 1 verse 20, that he has reconciled all things to himself. He has put all things in subjection under His feet. And the picture here is of an ancient king who would defeat his foes and they would be brought into his throne room and forced to bow before his throne. And in a symbol of, of utter devastation over that foe, the king would put his feet upon the neck of that conquered foe. And so it represents a position of utter supremacy, utter superiority, and utter sovereignty. He has put all things in subjection under His feet. But when He says all things are put in subjection, it is evident, meaning it is very clear that He is accepted. That He is God the Father. The Father will never be in subjection to the Son within the Trinity. And so, Paul, very, a very crystal clear theologian, making this sweeping statement in verse 27, all things are put in subjection under His feet. And then he says, well, there is one exception. The Father. He will never be put under the feet of Christ. So it is evident that He is accepted who put all things in subjection to Him. Now watch this, verse 28. When all things are subjected to Christ, then the Son Himself also 
will be subjected. To the One, that is God the Father, who subjected all things to Him, so that God may be all in all. Let me explain to you what this means. That what the Father is doing throughout all of human history is having exalted His Son to His right hand, and He has earned the right to be there by His death upon the cross as He humbled Himself to death, even death upon a cross. In all of human history, God is now working to bring all things into subjection under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is progressively happening, and in the end, it will be brought to dramatic consummation. And once the Father has brought all things into subjection to the Son, in an act of love that the Father has for the Son, in an act of honoring His own Son, there will then be the expression of a reciprocal love that the Son will have for the Father. And after the Father has brought all things into subjection to the Son, at the end of all time and at the beginning of all eternity, the Son will then put all things into subjection to the Father, including Himself in this mutual, reciprocal expression of love. The Father putting all things in subjection to the Son. The Son then will put all things into subjection to the Father and they will reign together forever and ever and the Son even in subjection to the Father. That is what this is saying. And this is the expanded meaning of Colossians 1.20 when it says that through Him to reconcile all things to Himself. Some reconciled to condemnation. Some reconciled unto salvation. But all things reconciled unto submission. Come to the book of Ephesians, if you would, for a moment. Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to see this master theme of all things in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, I want you to see in verse 10. I'll begin reading in verse 9. This extraordinary pastoral doxology at the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians. Verses 4 through 6, the glory of the Father. Verses 7 through 12, the glory of the Son. And verse 13 and 14, the glory of the Spirit. This inner Trinitarian doxology. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son. Glory to the Spirit. In the midst of these verses, giving glory to the Son, beginning in verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. He has lavished this forgiveness and grace upon us, period. In all wisdom and insight, we could put in the Father's absolute genius. He made known to us the mystery of His will. And this is the mystery of history. This is what it's all about. This is the central thread of all that God is doing and ever will do in the history of the world. This is the mystery of His will now made known to us. Wouldn't you like to know what it's all about? According to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him, and this purpose is His eternal purpose long before He created anything. Verse 10, now here is the mystery of His will. With a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. And the fullness of times refers to the end of time, to the end of the ages, to the beginning of eternity. This is 
the mystery of His will towards which He is bringing all that He has created. That is, now here it is. Here's the purpose for everything. The summing up of all things. Does that sound familiar? All things in Christ. Meaning that all things would be brought into submission to Christ and that Christ would be acknowledged as Lord by every tongue and that every knee would bow before Him and that all of creation and all of history would be summed up in this submission to Christ. And notice he amplifies just like he does in Colossians 1 at the end of verse 10. Things in the heavens and things on earth. That means whether they be visible or invisible, whether realms of angelic beings in heaven, or whether it be realms of mankind upon the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined. God has determined before the beginning this summing up in Christ, it is, it is immutable, it is irreversible. This will, this will come to pass according to His purpose who works all things after the counsel of His will. There's nothing outside of that verse. That is the most all-inclusive statement perhaps in the entire Bible other than Romans 11.36. All things summed up in submission to Christ. Now, look at verse 20. After Paul gives this doxology in verses 3 through 14, he's like any preacher, he can't let it go. And he brings it back up again. And it's as if sometimes after I make the closing announcement, I just still have to keep preaching. And so, Paul, it's lingering with him, and so in the beginning in verse 15, he he develops this prayer for them, and at the heart of it is in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He is praying, I want you to have the eternal perspective. I want you to see the big picture. I don't want you to be an ostrich with, you, with your head buried in the sand anymore. I don't want you to be living a common little micro-Christian life. As if all there is, is what's going to happen Monday morning. I want you to have this staggering macro picture. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. Now, come down to verse 20. Having talked about in verse 19 our, the resurrection of Christ and our being resurrected, verse 20 which He brought about in Christ. And now, once Paul says, in Christ, he launches. When He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And those are all layers of angelic hierarchies. And every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That covers it. Look at verse 22. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church. This is the crown jewel of the church. It's not who we are, it's who He is. And God has given Him to us as the head of the church. This, this Christ who is supreme and sovereign over heaven and earth, over all powers, all authorities, all dominions, all creation, brought into submission under His feet, and now He is placed as head over the body, the church. It's extraordinary. Come to the book of Philippians. Philippians. You remember chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, when Paul, we looked at this last Sunday, but just to remind you, in verse 8, after his death, verse 9, I've already quoted it twice, 
But it says the very same thing. Therefore also God highly exalted Him. Not just exalted Him, but highly exalted Him. He is so high and lifted up and transcendent. He is the Lord God, the Almighty. And bestowed upon Him the name which is above every name. That name is L-O-R-D, Lord. So that, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess, whether saved or lost, whether angelic or human, whether elect or fallen, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of the Father. And once every knee bows, and once every tongue confesses, and it's all been given over to the Son and under the Son, the Son will then take it as well as Himself and place it all under the Father. In this act of mutual, reciprocal honor and love one for the other. And quite frankly, you and I are just like caught up as little subplots in this whole master theme of the Father showing His love to the Son and the Son showing His love to the Father. And we're just caught up in this exchange of gifts between the Father and the Son that began in eternity past. Look at Philippians 3 and verse... 20 and 21. Philippians 3 and verse 20 and 21, for our citizenship is in heaven. Paul, you are living on this earth. You are a Roman citizen. No. When I look on my spiritual passport, it says citizen colon heaven. I'm just a stranger and an alien. I'm a vagabond down here. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, upon the time of His return, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. What that means is He is the first fruits of the resurrection. And at the time of Christ's return, at the rapture, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and all the dead in Christ will rise, and we will be taken up to meet the Lord in the air, and in that split second, we will all be made exactly like Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, verse 2. When He appears, we shall be made like Him because we shall see Him just as He is. We will not be able to look upon Him in His glory, in our humble state, until we are first made like Him, glorified, to be able, as glorified humanity, to look upon the glorified Savior. Or it would be like staring at the noonday sun. We would just evaporate and shrivel up. And so in that moment as we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, verse 21, He will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory so that with glorified eyes we may behold Him as He is and with a glorified heart we may love Him and live in His presence. Otherwise, it would be easier for you to catch a space shuttle, fly to the sun and walk around on the surface of the sun in your humble state. You would just, it would be like you were in, a, in a, an incinerator. You would just burn up in His presence. Verse 21, by the exertion of the power, what resurrection power there is. By the exertion of the power that He has, now watch this, even to subject all things to 
himself. Not only does he have that power, he is using that power. He is wielding that power. And at the end of this age, he will bring everyone and everything into subjection under his feet that we might declare his lordship and declare him as king of kings and lord of lords. There will be no resistance. The opposition, he will slay them with his breath. He will effortlessly, for he spoke it all into existence effortlessly. He will subject it all effortlessly effortlessly because he remains retains perpetually in the strength of his youth as Psalm 110 says so this is the expanded New Testament version of what Paul writes in Colossians 1 verse 20 so come back now to Colossians 1 verse 20 So in verse 20, when he says, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, that part of the verse is not speaking of salvation. It is speaking of submission. To bring all things unto himself. The all things, verse 16, that he created. The all things, verse 17, that he preceded. The all things, verse 17, that He holds together. The all things, in verse 18, that He would come to have first place over. Now, verse 20, to reconcile all things to Himself. That is a universal reconciliation, not a universal atonement, nor a universal salvation. It is a universal submission and a universal accountability to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the very heart of this verse, in the very middle of verse 20, is a specific reconciliation, is a saving reconciliation. And it is a reconciliation that goes no wider than those who believe Upon Christ. It is a being brought into the kingdom of heaven and being graced with His forgiveness and being brought into right relationship with God's, with God the Father. So we, we read in the middle of verse 20, and let me point this out to you, at the end of verse 20, He goes back to the universal reconciliation. And notice at the end of verse 20, through Him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven, that parallels the beginning of this verse to reconcile all things. All things on earth, all things in heaven. But in the middle, the middle part of this verse we read, having made peace through the blood of His cross. I want to assure you, no lost sinner has peace with God. No fallen angel has peace with God. This is reserved exclusively at the heart of this in a, in a saving way to be brought into alignment with God the Father through the blood of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, look at it again. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Now, He will amplify that in verse 22. Notice verse 22. Yet He, Christ, has now reconciled you. It's no, that's not all things. That is you. Who is the you? The you are believers in Jesus Christ. This is a limited, specific, saving death of Christ upon the cross with universal implications. Verse 22, yet He has now reconciled you. He has not reconciled the non-elect to Himself. He has reconciled only the church. Now He says, in His fleshly body, and the reason He says that is because the Colossian heretics were saying, 
Not only is Jesus not God, they were saying He's also not man. He is only a spirit being. He is, he is a ghost. And so Paul emphasizes this to affirm his, his humanity. He affirmed His deity in verse 19. In verse 15, he now affirms his humanity that he is both fully God, fully man, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He is the God-Man. He has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. The Colossian heretics were saying he never died because a spirit being can't die. Paul says no. He was fully man while he was fully God. And in that fleshly body, He suffered death. He died upon that cross. Why? The wages of sin is what? Death. If we are to be saved, He must die. Not just struggle. Not just be in agony. Not just have pain. He must die if He is to pay the penalty for our sin. So He has reconciled you in His fleshly body through death, now watch this, in order to present you. Here is the accomplishment of His death. Here is the fruit of His death. To present you, again now, He doesn't present all things holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Oh no. It's the you. You who are in Christ. You who are saved. The rest, condemned. The rest judged. The rest damned. But you who are in Christ, He will present you, watch this, three words, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now this holiness presents you holy through His death he presents you as holy as He Himself is holy. Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It's the great exchange of the cross. All my sin laid upon the sinless One and all of His holiness given to the unholy ones. Through His death at the cross, He now makes us as holy and as pure as He is holy. This is justification. This is the imputed righteousness of Christ charged to our account. We don't always live this way, do we? But this is our standing before God. As God sees you, He sees the holiness of His own Son. Oh, to be in Christ is to be accepted by the Father. And then He says, blameless. And beyond reproach. That means no charge can be brought against us. That, that means no accusation that can stick can be brought against us. Oh, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he will accuse us before God, but we have a great high priest at the right hand of God the Father, and those for whom he pleads his blood shall never perish, nor shall any accusation ever be received by the Father on our behalf. You know, sometimes I'm the subject of slander. Sometimes I'm the subject of merciless people, unfortunately, more in the church than outside the church. And there's a part of me at times that just wishes, I wish someone would be there to just set the matter straight. That'll never happen in this world. But it doesn't really matter what any mere person thinks about me or you, you know that? If it does, you think too highly of yourself for it to even matter, quite frankly. All that really matters is who would slander you before God? Who would bring an accusation behind your back 
before God in order to incriminate you with the only one with whom it really matters. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the very right hand of God the Father is the one who died for you upon the cross. And Hebrews 7.25 says, He ever lives to make intercession for us. And every accusation that comes before the Father's throne, and why God allows Satan to do this, I do not have a clue. I see it in Job chapter 1. I see it in Job chapter 2. I do not understand it. I accept it by faith. Satan is allowed to come before the throne of God where he does not belong and of all things to accuse us before the Father. And Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and your names are written in the palm of His hand. And your name is engraven upon His ephod. And He pleads His blood on your behalf. And never does an accusation come from Satan or by any other person here that has any merit or any worth with the Father because it is all under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most times the people who are bringing the accusation are the very people whom Christ is not interceding for at the right hand of God. This is an extraordinary passage. And so he concludes in verse at the end of verse 20, Through Him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And he returns to his original thought at the beginning of verse 20, this reconciling of all things to himself. He comes back now and says, through him, notice the exclusivity of this, through him and no one else, through Christ alone. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Again, everything brought into submission before Christ. In John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says that the Father has given all judgment to the Son. The Father takes a step back and the Son takes a step forward. And it is the Son who now presides over the universe to the Father's glory. It is now the Son who executes judgment to the glory of the Father who watches. And in John 5, 28 and 29, He says that there is coming a resurrection at the end of the age. A resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto judgment. And the Son presides over it all. It is the voice of the Son who will raise the dead. It is the voice of the Son who will execute the decree. It is the voice of the Son who will say eternal life. It is the voice of the Son who will say eternal damnation. But all things reconciled to the Son that the Son might have the place of unrivaled supremacy and unrivaled glory over all that He has created, for He made it by Himself and for Himself. How will Christ be glorified in your life? He will be glorified in your life. How? Will He be glorified now in salvation? His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness put on display and manifested in your life, lavishing His forgiveness and the riches of His grace upon you. Is that how He is being glorified in your life? For others, He will be glorified in your damnation. He will be glorified in your damnation as His wrath, His righteousness 
His eternality will be put on display. This is a day of grace. The doors leading into the kingdom are wide open. The gates of paradise have been swung open. And you now have this time, this opportunity to by faith enter through the narrow gate that leads to life. This gate will one day close, never to be opened before you again. And while there is time and while there is opportunity, I beg of you, come to Christ. And you will live forever. Refuse Christ. And you will have a mere existence throughout all the eternities to come under His wrath. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.